All right, welcome everybody. We are having another panel discussion with my esteemed colleagues, Patrick Benham Crosswell, James Black of RAND, Nicholas Drummond of Aura Consulting. And we're talking this week about two profound documents released by the government. First, the Integrated Defense Security Development Foreign Policy Review, which came out, um, uh, where are we, 12 days before we're talking now. And, uh, and then in the following week, essentially a week later, the um, command document from the Ministry of Defense, which unpacked some of the Ministry, De Ministry of Defense's plans pursuant to that integrated review. So welcome everybody. In the interest of time, uh, let's get some general reactions to these two main documents. There are other documents um, even pursuant to the command paper, and we probably will discuss those too. But I do want to get general reactions to these very uh, important high level documents. The integrated review to, to, to remind our audience is only comes about every five years at its quickest. And this integrated review is a year late. Um, and then the command papers, essentially white papers, they're not, uh, they're not frequent either. Um, so let's get some general uh, reactions. I'll, I'll just go first in the in the interest of efficiency. Um, I'll say I, I was given how long we've waited for the integrated review. I was a little disappointed with its. It was shallow in some areas. It didn't it didn't specify as much or at the level of threats as I was expected. There was some confirmation of how the government perceives Russia and China, but still it was not as specified, it was not as firm in its conceptualizations of international threats as one would hope in order to then develop specifications requirements um, at the material level. So I was a little disappointed in that. Um, uh, I also thought there was some, uh, some issues um, denied and ignored in the integrated review. I thought it was quite significant that the army doesn't get a single mention in the integrated review, although the command document tries to uh, make some amends there. I thought that was interesting. And I know we, we're, we're all soldiers and we've done most of our consulting to the MOD on the army. So naturally we're focused on the army. Um, I, think, I think there's still, uh, that's not to, to, to deny that we've got things to say about the RAF and the Navy too, and even Space Command. Um, so that's, that, that was my, those are my disappointed disappointments with the integrated review. Um, then the command document, um, you know, I, I have to say I was so disappointed with how that was written too. I mean, I'm used to old fashioned white papers, like options for change, going, that was the first white paper I had to deal with, options for change. You know, that had tables of data and it specified this is what this force structure is and this is what it's going to be. You don't see that in the command document. We, we've had, just so the audience knows, the four of us, we've had some email exchanges trying to work out what's, what's not said in the command document. What's the force structure going to look like? And Nicholas particulars has helped us with that. I, was, I don't think that's, that's, I don't think the command paper is, is as specific on things like full structure as, as it should have been. That is the, the, not just my expectations. I think this is um, this is what most people in the defense community expected. We, we expected more specifics on full structure and equipment for that matter. Th those are my quick reactions. Um, let's get quick reactions from each of you. Let's start with Patrick. Um, well, I mean, the thing, first thing that struck me was, um, the fact that you need to develop an integrated policy kind of shows that something's gone a bit wrong in the whole defense world. And I, 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 I echo all your sentiments about the lack of detail. Um, I think it's becoming increasingly the case that the MOD can't continue to pretend that the, 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 the realm is defended. Our armed forces are currently a pretend king village and one little sniff and it all goes wrong i was struck that um we seem to be remain russia obsessed which presumably is because of nato when all the all the action looks like being a long way east of here and it seemed to me even in both the papers that we've seen we're already double counting assets particularly helicopters um i suspect probably the same with um aircraft carriers 
I don't see how the Royal Navy are ever going to be able to cope with an expanded area of operations at, 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 a, at a considered considerably higher level of readiness with a with an unextended fleet um, and the type 32 frigate whatever that will be isn't going to be cutting metal for a decade um, and turning to the army which has been paired even more uh, we now seem to be betting the entire ranch on the deep battle the deep battle is fine we were developing that um, before we won the cold war um, but there are real technology issues um, and there are real difficult questions that I'm not sure there's anyone in the MOD who understands the issues. So if you like it, it seemed to me almost as being a confession and dressed up, and dressed up as you say, in the Stalin part, so it is a children's comic. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah, thank you. So James, what did you get? Yeah, so I, on the integrated review, um, I mean, this is obviously long awaited, as you said, uh, it was kind of the remit of a traditional strategic defense and security review that we have every five years or so it was, it was obviously expanded post Brexit to, to look at those other um, kind of soft leader powers uh, and, and different parts of government. We've obviously seen the merger of the Foreign Office and DFID, which was, I suppose, going to be one of the kind of big surprise announcements of the IR that actually ended up happening before the IR came out because it was the delay in completing the review. Um, so there was a lot riding on this, and I certainly think it, yeah, I, I agree that for something that has been delayed due to COVID and Brexit and other things for, you know, a year or so beyond what it was supposed to be, um, there are a few areas where you, you might have expected certain decisions or actions to have already been made or taken rather than to just be set out that these will be things that the government does in the, you know, the early 2020s. That being said, I mean, I do think it is more integrated than kind of previous reviews. It is more cross-government. Whether that is sufficient, we can we can argue about. But you know, it is a step in that direction, and, and I think that's a positive one. Um, you know, these things are inevitably going to be written by committee, even at a departmental level. But particularly when you are trying to do that kind of genuinely integrated cross-government view, there there would be a real danger that it would descend into you know lots of interdepartmental rivalries and kind of compromises and lowest common denominator. And, and you can you could probably point a few areas where you could you could argue some of that is, is present. But I would say that there is actually a, a big idea in there. You can you can argue whether the big idea is the right idea, but I think the IR does articulate an idea. And that idea is that the you know the UK is going to try and take on a unique post-Brexit role as a Kind of global medium a globally oriented medium power that will kind of lean heavily on certain kind of asymmetric advantages it has and try and mitigate some of the weaknesses it has so it, it is leaning on yes kind of russia and the euro atlantic still as, as patrick has said but actually you know there is this tilt to the indo-pacific um I, th I imagine the language of tilt rather than pivot is supposed to imply that it's a bit smaller than the us pivot um, you know, we are still ultimately bound by geography and geo strategy and geopolitics to, to the, you know, the North Atlantic, the Euro Atlantic. But there is this tilt towards, you know, east of Suez. There's going to be more of a global presence. There's more stuff in um, East Africa and in, in Oman, in Brunei and Singapore and, and other places. Um, so the UK is going to try and have a more global role. And then associated with that, it's going to try and lean into a few, a few kind of key perceived strengths. And again, we can argue whether they're actual strengths, but they're perceived strengths. So one is the kind of uh, network of kind of alliances and partnerships, the kind of soft power that we have, which, you know, certainly we, we can argue about whether that's been degraded over time, but it's certainly much more, you know, soft, soft power and friend, uh, friendly actors than our adversaries have, because they're, they're generally quite isolated politically. Uh, leaning on science and technology is the next core, core idea. Um, which again, we can deny, we can argue about whether that's going to be su sufficient to kind of offset the lack of mass and the small size of the UK population, small size of the UK forces and so on. But it is an area that, you know, the UK does retain some, some real strengths and, you know, strong academic base and, and industry and whatever. And then finally, um, kind of this kind of shift towards resilience as a new theme. Um, which is very new. And I, and I mean, that's been accelerated by COVID, I'm sure, which has obviously shown us 
how fragile modern kind of digital societies can be. But it's also, um, I think, reflects the broader work that's been happening in government since the National Security Capability Review in 2016, 2017, which um, you know, recognised that kind of foreign policy, military issues, home affairs, policing, you know, all these different issues just weren't joined up enough. And, and so I think there's a positive step that we're seeing more talk about resilience. Um, on the command paper quickly, I mean, we'll, we'll go into the specifics, I'm sure, in this conversation. I think the main thing, the main things to note there for me is one that this is actually mostly funded, which is quite a big distinction from what we had before. So, you know, we can argue about whether certain cuts in numbers of certain platforms and, and whatever may or may not be sensible. But I think the important thing to remember is that the numbers that we had before were largely notional in some places. So um, it, it's not necessarily fair to compare if we, you know, well, I'm sure we'll talk about Challenger, for example, later, um, or, or Warrior, you know, you could argue that some of the plans around that were pretty notional anyway, as they weren't very well funded and they were overdue and so on. Um, at least now we have uh, a clearer idea. Same on personnel, you know, the, the army is supposedly cutting 10,000 people, but in reality, they're actually cutting about 4,000 or if, if fewer, because they're so under strength anyway that, you know, they're, they're really just acknowledging a, a reality. Um, but in terms of other big takeaways, I mean, yeah, I mean, the Navy has done relatively well. As Patrick said, there's going to be some short term cuts in fleet sizes, but longer term, it's supposedly going to grow. Um, and it's also making much greater use of automation and autonomous systems, particularly for some of like the mine hunting tasks and things like that. And obviously it's got the subs and uh, Trident and, and other things which suck up a lot of money. Um, the, the RAF, again, there's some short-term cuts. I mean, a notable one around airborne early warning and, and control, but um, you know there is a commitment to go beyond the 48 F-35s, which is a bit of a surprise to some. Um, where, where that number ends up being, I don't know, but I imagine it may well be short of 138 we originally said we'd get, but more money for Tempest as a kind of sovereign UK program instead. And then, yeah, the army is, is, is I suppose, done the least well in terms of the kind of headlines. Um, some you know some welcome new kind of focus on things like long range fires and, and stuff like that but clearly at the expense of some of the kind of older legacy platforms and personnel and force structures and stuff that we mentioned um and i think a, a real question for all of the services about how they maintain the levels of readiness and overseas deployment that i think is implicit well no quite explicit throughout all of the documents that they're going to have to do you know more with less or more with the same and there's a lot of stock put in technology and digitalization and so on to do that. But there's a, a broader cultural question, I think, about whether the MOD is really configured to take on that task. The one final, final comment would be on the, the other document that came out, which is the Defense and Security Industrial Strategy, which um, is the least glossy and least well formatted and um, kind of promoted of the three documents, but does in there contain, in, in all the kind of grisly you know, tedious detail about procurement reform and so on. There are some pretty big shifts actually in how the UK military and UK MOD approach industry. So moving away from competition by default to working much more with UK industry and with key partners to try and make sure that certain technologies are kept in this country and also to try and understand the broader social and economic benefits that the UK um, defence industry brings to the wider nation. And that is actually a really big shift for a country that's historically been very laissez-faire in its approach to the industry compared to people like France, the US, or, or other Europeans. Thank you, James. Yeah, I wanted to go through this order of uh, panelists because I know you contributed to some of those documents that you mentioned in part. Now, Nicholas, you've also contributed at least in the form of testimony to Parliament. Um, so, sir, what have you got? Nicholas. So, you know, I, I think this was a very welcome process, uh, very necessary because we had not really done this properly since 1998. And the 1998 Defence White Paper was an extremely well considered review, but it was never implemented because of 9-11 uh, and the war on terror that followed. So there had been a real disconnect between the uh, commitments that we felt we had to do 
um, and what we were able to actually afford to be able to do. And so we had to really pull back and realign foreign policy with defense policy. And that was obviously the original ambition of the integrated review. And actually, I think it's done a good job in that sense at a high level of setting out um, in, in the primary paper what our foreign policy objectives are. And I thought it was a, a, actually a, a stunning strategic blueprint uh, across a whole range of government activities into which defense would slot into. So, you know, I was impressed by that. But what I would say is that actually when you look at the commitments that are in that document, it is not a scaling back, it's an expansion. And so like every other defense review of the last 50 years, uh, it's a triumph of ambition over affordability. Uh, will we actually be able to do all of this stuff? Remains to be seen. Um, the, the original aspiration was to say, look, we can't afford to do everything uh, to a very high standard. And rather than doing everything badly, let's select a few key commitments and resource them properly and do them to the highest possible standard. Unfortunately, I think that very worthy strategy has been overtaken by events. And so um, where will we come out? It's difficult to say. Um, it, that's the high level paper. Uh, I'll just speak very briefly about the Defense Command paper. I thought it was a mess. Clearly it had been changed at the last minute. Uh, there is a good strategy in there, but it just didn't come out. And I, a very poor piece of communication. Uh, and that's why I sat down and had a look at the structure of the army. And once I began to see what it would look like, I thought, actually, this is not bad. It'll take a bit of work to get it to where we need, but really they could have done a better job at communicating what they wanted to achieve. Yeah, thank you, Nicholas. So um, everybody, you, you've given us a lot to talk about and we don't have much time to, to deal with all the issues coming up here. Um, I, I suppose if we can sort of, move down from the highest levels downwards, um, the implications are sort of somewhat abstract. Um, as Nicholas articulated, there's this tension between ambition and, and affordability. That's a perpetual problem in British defense. And James, you know, you've, you've articulate some tensions between the services, uh, you know, the army is going to feel aggrieved um, relatively so in terms of relative gains, this is not a good hasn't been a good couple of weeks for the army, but it hasn't been a good few years for the army for that matter. So there are sort of these higher level tensions and, and I, I think we should start there. If we can start maybe with this tension between ambition and affordability, one, an, another, another way to think about this is there's, there's certainly over, there's, there's a risk of over ambition in some of these areas. Um, we might, think about cyber, like, so the, the document is very ambitious about cyber. I, I did some search terms, uh, searches for terms, and cyber, cyber appears in the document 156 times. And by comparison, um, you know, NATO appears 45 times, that's relatively high count, uh, you know, climate change appears 90 times, or climate, the word climate in various semantic framings occurs 90 times, nine zero times. You know, China, 27 times, most of the reporting, journalistic reporting is focused on what the British government has, how the British government has characterized China as a certain type of threat. It, it, it only appears 27 times compared to cyber. So you know, cyber is clearly a focus. It, 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 there is a lot of ambition there. There's, there's structural commitments, like the army is gonna have a cyber unit. Um, there's going to be uh, there's going to be a, a civilian in civilian government. There's going to be an II uh, artificial intelligence department. Um, the, the 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 GCHQ is going to have a, a structure is going to restructure more along the lines of how the US does um, cyber command uh, as part of its civilian cyber agency, the NSA. Um, so there, there's major structural changes. The government's clearly investing in cyber. Um, so we might say, we might ask, is that over ambitious? But at, at the same time, we should consider under ambition. So under ambition. So 
some of the complaints we've seen in the press from particularly conservative members of parliaments, parliament have been uh, the, what have been asking why can't we do why can't we invest in cyber without cutting the army are we being under ambitious that we have to give up on legacy systems at the same time as we invest in new systems because there's a risk as, of over optimizing for a cyber war and leaving ourselves uh, under capacity for old-fashioned boots on the ground operation so i think that there are i'm adding in a new tension here so in addition to the ambition versus affordability tension that nick, nick articulated the inter-service tensions that james articulated i'm adding a tension between it which is between over ambition in certain areas and under ambition in other areas um, at the most high highest levels um who wants to come in on that, any of that um if I, yeah, I, I mean, I've got a few, a few comments. I mean, I think the, the this is certainly how the, the debate has often been framed in the papers and kind of various think tanks and whatever. It's, it's kind of, you know, you can have ships and planes and tanks, or you can have data centers and, you know, lots of clever kind of um, wizardry with a laptop. And, you know, there is an, there is an element to which, of course, there, is, there are trade-offs made within the budget finite resources have to be spent on certain things and not spent on other things. But I think actually, you know, the reality is, is that we're talking about even those kind of more legacy platforms we're talking about operating in a very contested cyber and electromagnetic environment in future, um, both in terms of what happens on the battlefield, if there is a defined battlefield in, you know, in future conflict, which there may well be in a kind of high end, you know, NATO Article 5 type um, scenario, but there might not be in, in other kind of more ambiguous or grey zone scenarios that the, the MOD talks about. Um, but also, you know, also the cyber threats to the, the supply chain defence, you know, a lot of the SMEs that, work, that plug into large defence prime contractors obviously don't have the time, people, technology, etc. to keep up to date with all the latest kind of cybersecurity issues. Um, government and wider society is obviously increasingly dependent on cyber. And I'd add, I'd add to that space as well, which also, you know, features much more prominently in this IR and command paper than ever before. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's a given that you're absolutely going to have to spend money on that to, to a fair degree. I think what, what complicates the narrative that it's kind of, you know, legacy capabilities or data you know, data and AI and cyber, is that actually for a start, a lot of the cyber stuff is obviously cross government. So you're not drawing necessarily on the same budgets because it's actually drawing on, uh, you know, the home office and the, the front office and, and so on through the various um, agencies uh, of which obviously GCHQ is the, the main player. Um, it also plays, you know, it, cyber, cyber and other related capabilities also speak to the UK's role in NATO and other organizations. So. You know, the UK is one of the the only uh, NATO allies, first of all, to have kind of, you know, very serious cyber defense and, and offensive cyber capabilities in the way that a lot of smaller countries just can't afford. Um, but also it's the only country that kind of politically and doctrinally has committed its offensive cyber capabilities to the alliance. So a bit like how it commits its nuclear deterrent to the alliance that also comes with certain obligations, um, which, you know, the UK has to lead on. So I, I think to take your point about what this then means for trade-offs for things like the army is I do think we're seeing a shift towards the UK armed forces looking a, a bit more like what the US Marine Corps are doing at the moment. So the US Marine Corps has got rid of their, which is effectively the same size actually as the UK armed forces and is similarly a kind of you know, multi-domain organization because the, the US Marine Corps has aircraft, it's got tanks, it's got ships, it's, it's got a lot. They're getting rid of their tanks, they're getting rid of their heavier forces, they're getting rid of a lot of their tube artillery, and they are re repositioning themselves as a kind of lightweight, highly deployable, um, low signature, kind of conceit, you know, camouflaged, um, electronic warfare equipped, precision fires equipped, um, kind of agile, you know, multi-domain force. 
which is sort of where we're heading as well. So, so much more lightweight, but taking on niche roles that then maybe support other players like the US, the Germans, the Poles, who will perhaps do more of the heavy lifting when it comes to traditional things like armored warfare. Um, the important difference I would, I would finish on is that obviously the US Marine Corps is making that bet um, as one of the services. Uh, it is admittedly a kind of a pocket military in its own right, but it is one of the services in the US. So they are sort of underwritten by the other services. So they're taking a lot of, you know, there's taking certain risks with certain potential benefits around cutting certain capabilities, but they know that the US Army is going to be there behind them with all of those legacy capabilities still there en masse. And they know the US Air Force is going to be there and they know the US Navy is going to be. The, the UK obviously doesn't have that luxury. So it is taking a, a series of bets about kind of future multi domain war fighting that may or may not be correct, but it, it is more exposed, I suppose, than. It would perhaps like to be the question of course is what what else could you do about that you know with, with other than just increasing defense spending which you know is already happening and politically wouldn't be tenable to go any further i, I just don't know how you square that circle um, in current conditions yeah patrick yeah i mean the thing that worries me um most is probably the the, the plank of the new stuff is cyber artificial intelligence and drones. And those are not well-defined terms. You can call almost anything artificial intelligence if you're creative enough. And we've, it seems to me the tension is that's where everyone wanted to go. And someone had a reality check and said, yeah, but before you do that, just look at what toys we've got in the shed and the amount of technological risk you're taking on to deliver what may very well end up looking remarkably like the United States Marine Corps. Um, um, and I think the army's actually done quite well to hold on to the ability to go and fight someone tomorrow if it had to. Um, I think one of the other tensions that's going to come up is going to be very into service and it's going to relate to close air support and the ownership and operation of helicopters. Thank you, Patrick. Nicholas. Well, it, it, it's an interesting topic, isn't it? Um, my own view is, I, and I was very disappointed by the cut in headcount because actually at the end of the day, you do need critical mass. And I'm not sure that the army does have critical mass now. I think it would really struggle to replace battlefield casualties if it had to deploy against a peer adversary at scale. I think it's a real problem. Um, but then again, we haven't got enough vehicles to equip the whole army. Uh, and so we're, re we're really struggling with the modernization of the army. And you know, what, you know, as Ben Wallace said in Parliament on, on, on Monday, do you have a larger force equipped to a low standard or a smaller force equipped to a higher standard? And my view is that if you have a smaller force equipped to a higher standard, once you have a benchmark capability established, you can then expand that and roll it out across a larger army. And then you can grow back from that. But if you're starting from a lower baseline, that's, it, it's, it's much harder and more difficult to grow it out. And of course, the amount of modernization we need is so deep and fundamental across so many areas, but I just don't see how else, um, you know, that we could do it. And of course, when you talk about a tilt towards the Indo-Pacific, uh, and that's a very real thing, um, we have to prioritize the Navy and the RAF above the Army. We don't know what the Army would do out there. So there's a real risk in investing in the wrong new resources for the army. And until we understand how we might deploy to that region, I think we need to wait before we start spending a lot of money on new kit. But in terms of ships and aircraft, you know, that's, that is a fairly fixed requirement. Uh, and so I think it was those priorities that were set were, were, were right. I, I was very pleased that we committed to more F-35. You know, this attempt is going to be, um, you know, a fix-all for the problems of F-35. It's not. We spent a hundred billion dollars on F-35. That buys you a lot of capability. And when you talk about stealth technology, to think that um, Tempest is going to be any cheaper to maintain when there are going to be a fewer number, um, I think that's a little bit naive. So I think we're absolutely right to stick to our guns and to acquire as many F-35 as we can. Uh, and where there's talk of 60 now, not 48, 
Um, but I would like to see probably 90, a minimum of 90. But I, I, I'm expecting costs to come down. So, you know, we may yet get there. Yeah. So thank you, Nicholas. I mean, there's, there's a couple of things I'm going to highlight in what you just said. One is that you essentially said, um, you know, we've got to wait and see, which is kind of ironic. We've just had this integrated review, <laughs> which has a 10 year horizon and only comes around once every five years. And yet, uh, you know, we kind of have to wait and see to see what capabilities we need for this tilt towards Indo-Pacific. So there's, there's kind of a irony, I don't, I don't know if irony or maybe it's a perversity in that, that even the integrated review hasn't clarified what we need in terms of capabilities, at least in that tilt. Um, I think um, in the interest of being efficient here, I think what we should move on to next is, can we, can we tick away any of the things that the government's tried to do here, any of its objectives or aims, can we tick them, as way, tick them away now as sorted as correctly specified, uh, correctly researched, correctly founded, and correctly um, planned. So that, that might be cyber and space. Um, those are clearly the two main um, topics or subjects for the integrated review. So I just did a quick search. Uh, James mentioned space, and that reminded me. I mentioned earlier cyber appears 156 times, space appears 147 times in the context of outer space, not, not, not just cyberspace. So can, these, those two things, can we say that the government's got these things right, it's investing correctly, it's planning correctly, it's got the level of, um, level of commitment, the, 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 has it correctly assessed the threats and the capabilities it's, that it's requiring? Has it got those things right? And then, and then we can turn to maybe the things that it's not, uh, it's not getting right. Anybody want to come in on either cyberspace in that context? I, yeah, I can talk about space because I've, I've, I mean, I've been doing some work with the, the space agency and the MOD recently. I mean, so there's, there's going to be a national space strategy out at some point this year, probably the summer. There's a um, going to be a defense space strategy that goes with that, it's similar to how the command paper relates to the, the IR. Um, you know, there's been a lot of things happening in space, both in terms of UK policy. So UK has set up a National Space Council. It's bought a 45% share in OneWeb, which is a, a company that just launched, I can't remember which fifth or sixth mission um, with lots of small satellites to go into um, low Earth orbit and, and create a kind of global um, telecommunications um, service. Um, it's obviously pulled out Galileo as a GNSS program after Brexit or been asked to leave or one of the two or both. Um, and then we're setting up this space command, which goes live on the 1st of April. Um, and, and I think there's a, you know, there's space is probably a good example where, yes, it's benefiting from new investment. It is seen as a kind of sunrise rather than a sunset capability. But I think the, the UK has been very eyes open about you know the low baseline that it's it's working from so there was a you know it was a good talk by um Air vice marshal half smith who's the mod space director and MOD, uh, atm paul godfrey who's the new space inaugural space commander um last week and i mean they were talking about you know being very realistic that we are starting from a low level of capability a low level of, of kind of understanding obviously a, a small number of people in defense who are specialists in space um, and really trying to understand what are the UK's unique strengths, what are its weaknesses, and what's its kind of value proposition to allies and partners. Because we have certain capabilities that are very high end, like the Skynet um, uh, MILSATCOM capability. Uh, we just lack a lot of stuff that goes around that. So we don't have sovereign launch capabilities that are coming in next year, although only small ones. Uh, we don't really have much space domain awareness. They're investing in that. We don't really have much space-based ISR. They're investing in that. And we don't really have much in the way of protect and defend capabilities in space. Um, but they, what well, they have recognized is instead, you know, we, we're, there are certain areas of things we're very good at, like small satellites. So let's focus on those. There are certain non-military leaders we're very good at, like soft power. So there's a big UK initiative in the UN at the moment around um, kind of responsible behaviors in space, which is seen as part of also space deterrence. So we're, we're kind of not kidding ourselves and saying we're going to go do everything, we're going to have all bells and whistles, all of the latest Gucci kit, 
we're saying we're going to specialize in certain areas and then we'll rely on you know industry or we'll rely on allies and partners in, in those areas that we can't so i think that is a very kind of mature um and kind of nuanced approach i would say that the the difference with something like cyber or space where you you can do that because you don't have legacy decisions um, or legacy structures or legacy culture to deal with. You're sort of operating from a blank piece of paper. Not, not quite, because as I said, you know, Skynet has, has been around for multiple generations now, but really you're operating with quite a lot of freedom. And that simply isn't the case if you're, you know, you're trying to make decisions about the structure of the army. Um, there's obviously all sorts of decisions that were made 20, 30, 40, 50, or you know, hundreds of years ago um that you you're having to to work around um so i think cyber cyber is harder to judge because so much of it is so classified that, that nobody can have an informed opinion from from open source information but but space you know is is well fairly well documented i think the other domains it's it's tough you know those they, there are some really tricky choices there which i'm sure nicholas and patrick will have use on yeah thank you jane so patrick you had your hand up first nicholas yeah, so I, I just want to jump in on cyber. So uh, somebody, again, a lot of it's highly classified, so it, it, one can only speculate without real knowledge. But if we could paralyze, for example, the Russian banking system, we could bring that country to a halt overnight. Couldn't pay anybody, you know, uh, all payments, um, electronic payments for, for goods and services couldn't, couldn't go through. You, you know, really uh, dramatic effects can be achieved using um, using cyber. Uh, even if you just prevent people from being able to communicate at, at all using mobile phones or whatever, you cause immense disruption. So I, I don't think we should underestimate cyber. Uh, and of course, um, let's just talk about the pandemic. Okay, we know that was not a biological weapon, but if it had been, then and China had already developed um, um, a vaccine, then it, it could achieve total economic domination without firing a single shot. And we are going into the realms of those kind of things now. And suddenly the traditional levers of power that we have pulled before are suddenly irrelevant. And so, you know, cyber, you know, as, as well as other kinds of um, weapons of mass destruction can can be extremely powerful and they can be used below the threshold. So very subtle um, and, and, and very scary. So we have to be mindful of that. We have to think about that. Uh, and we also have to think about the ethics of using those things. That, that it can also be, yeah, I mean, to, to jump in on that point, I mean, they can also be completely unintentional, right? So I mean, if we look at some of the recent major incidents like WannaCry and, and other things, you know, even back to kind of Stuxnet, we've seen lots of examples of um, so either non-state or state actors doing things in cyberspace that then have cascading effects that they didn't necessarily even intend um, because they, you know, things get into the wild and then start affecting um, various networks and computer systems that they they weren't necessarily originally targeted at. Um, so I mean, what you know, one cry we saw, which is you know, which was the big ransomware. Um, you know, we saw NHS computers affected by that, for example, and, and mercifully, it wasn't anything, you know, supremely critical and it wasn't, you know, locking down all the patient data or something like that. But in future, you know, we're going to see all sorts of threats to the homeland and to our will to fight, either as a nation or as an alliance, which will stem from these kind of non-kinetic effects. You know, it's very easy for a, a future adversary to go after our critical national infrastructure, go after our data, go after our, you know, our, our banking system, our governmental system, our media, our, our NHS, other things, and then say, you know, do you really want to go ship some, you know, ship some poor, poor, poor guys and some tanks over to Estonia or wherever it is that they don't want us to send them? You know, that is a pretty powerful potential coercive of, uh, lever they have over us. So I do understand why investing in those sorts of things seem is just a prerequisite of being credible in this day and age. Yeah, I suppose um, I'm going to jump in here with 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 somewhat of a reaction. I think we, we're, if we're still looking at cyber and space, I think I'm hearing from James and Nicholas that, uh, yes, the government needs to invest in those two things, that the risks, the risks are increasing 
in cyberspace and outer space. Um, I, I have to admit, I was somewhat surprised at the emphasis on cyber, somewhat alarmed on that in, in, a, in a somewhat counterintuitive sense, which is, I have always been led to believe that Britain is very good at cyber. It has certain material advantages, such as it's um, uh, having oversight, essentially, of a lot of infrastructure. So a lot of cyber traffic passes through Britain. America has the leading advantage in this. It is able to control uh, those zeros and ones because they pass through American infrastructure. And Britain has that privilege. Uh, particularly in traffic between Europe and America. And it's not just between Europe and America because a lot of server traffic in other regions like Africa ends up going through Western infrastructure, including Britain's infrastructure. So I've been un led to believe that Britain has this material advantage and then it has invested heavily in uh, the tools, the software tools to spy and if necessary to sabotage in cyberspace and it has done this nationally and it has also done this in cooperation with the United States, which is another privileged relationship. So I've been led to believe that Britain is strong in cyber and yet the government is saying to the tune of 156 mentions of the word cyber in the integrated review, it's saying it needs to invest in cyber. I can understand why the government needs to invest in space and completely agree that Brit Britain has underinvested in space. It has over relied on EU initiatives in recent years and American uh, dominance of space in preceding decades. I can understand why Britain needs to invest in space. I'm somewhat alarmed why it thinks it needs to invest in cyber. It's almost like an admission that actually we were not, we are not privately uh, in classified in the classified world. We're not actually as good. We're not as confident in cyberspace as I've been led to believe, if you can understand that, 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 uh, that understanding from my perspective. Patrick? Uh, it's, it's just a speculation and, and we'll no doubt come on to the deep battle and deep communications. But one thing that's changed over the past 30 years um, and as legacy systems go and new things come in, previously everything worked on military only operating systems. Your average hacker couldn't get access to, to hack them. As things go on to commercial operating systems for all the obvious reasons of cost and this, that, and the other, there's a core of capability that doesn't that used not to exist. And I suspect if you then said, right, we're going to take all our lovely weapons, chuck them on a ship, and go and fight east of Suez or or, or even the good old Russian bear, but now now east of Poland, and therefore we're also relying on a vulnerable comms link through a new satellite, I can see why you start thinking, yeah, we need to get more defensive about stuff we didn't think we needed to defend on. But that's speculation. I mean you can look at you can you can look at changes in the doctrine and wider published literature of our potential adversaries. And I yeah, there's been a real shift. You know, they all looked at the Gulf War, the first Gulf War. They looked at um kind of uh airland battle, the revolution of military affairs or you know, various names that has been, um, kind of, you know, network centric warfare, precision warfare. And they really took note of that um, and spent most of the 90s and, the, and this century investing in capabilities to denude to the advantages that the US and, and NATO have in that area. Of course, the US, UK, NATO all then went and got fairly distracted by um, counterinsurgency operations against non-peer adversaries for a long time and forgot how to do some of the stuff around electronic warfare and suppression of enemy, enemy air defences and all that sort of stuff because it just had no, no need to and was used to operating with air superiority, maritime superiority and then fairly uncontested electronic and, and space uh, superiority. That, that's all changing. You know, e even non-state actors can contest things in the cyber um, and EM uh, and, and even in space nowadays, you can jam and dazzle and spoof and, and whatever to your heart's content relatively easily as a, a non-state or a small state actor. Um, and if you, but if you look at the big players, you know, you look at Russian kind of doctrine and, and thinking, they're explicitly talking about uh, a kind of strategy of reflexive control and disorganization, which means effectively going after the key nodes and linkages in any NATO or US um, kind of reconnaissance strike complex. So going after the networks, going after the key decision makers, interrupting the flow of information or the trustworthiness of that information. 
and therefore frustrating our decision making, frustrating the the OODA loop, um, you know, the observe or uh, uh, decide and act, um, and therefore achieving an advantage over our forces and doing that either at the national level or, or, or at the alliance level. And, and obviously there's all sorts of kind of seams between different nations when it comes to sharing information. Same with China, you know, China is explicitly talking about what they call systems attack or systems confrontation, which is they don't see future conflict with the US or anyone else as being about who can you know, destroy the most ships and, and whatever. It's actually about two competing systems of systems. And if you can unravel the data links and the connections between individual platforms, between sensors and shooters, between, um, you know, forward deployed forces and then the reach back to operational and strategic commands, um, you're going to win. That's, that's their view. And obviously China can do that with like lots of physical stuff but a lot of it is actually the non-kinetic effect as well. Um, so, you know, I, I do see why that is, is a real focus. Even, you know, even North Korea, if you believe some sources, and it's hard with North Korea, obviously, but some sources say they're spending 10, 20% of their defense budget on cyber because they recognize that's an area where actually they can confuse and disorientate the enemy and then they can throw in all the usual, you know, tube artillery and tanks and whatever they have from the Soviet era. To, to back that up uh, and press home the advantage. Um, so I think I think you're right, Bruce. It's an area, cyber is one example of an area the UK sees itself as having a strength. But you know, I, I think it's an area that nobody can afford to rest on their laurels, and also an area where if it has been doing well so far, you know that that's quite, from a kind of uh, interdepartmental squabbling perspective. That's you know, if, if you're a department or an agency that's been delivering, it's quite easy to ask for more money, right? Whereas if there are obviously certain bits of defense that have not been delivering so well when it comes to programs, and I guess we'll talk about land in a second, um, but it, it becomes a bit hard to make that case, right? Because uh, they will say, well, we gave you money and what have you done for 10 years or 20 yeah, yeah. years? Yeah, well, there's a caveat to that, which is that uh, with, with a um, domain as technical as cyber, it's also very easy for the, um, for the requirers, the users, to pull the wool over the government's eyes and say, um, yes. there's critical vulnerability <laughs> here and you need to throw more billions at it than, than you already know. So every, you know, everything's changed, we have to adapt. And uh, as we've seen in MOD, MOD is not very good at um, evaluating outside claims from the industry about what you need and, and how everything's changed. Now we have this piece of kit, which is um, makes everything else obsolete. And, and there's a, chance that cyber procurement can look like that where it's very easy to bamboozle the government into thinking that everything's changed and uh you actually need this something this something yeah a, a critical just a one critical difference is i think cyber is often more about buying in people and expertise than it is about kit it's rarely about we need this new bit of hardware well if you do need, if you do need a bit of hardware it's normally fed you know Often it's very generic, just information technology. It's what you do with it that is the important thing, and that's that's often down to the people. But yeah, I, I agree that on technology more broadly, there is definitely a challenge being an intelligent customer for MOD that is only growing more difficult, both because the technology is becoming more complex, but also because the real changes are being driven by companies that don't sit in the normal defense industry with, with whom the MOD has a fairly good understanding, if not necessarily a perfect relationship. You know, the, the MOD understands BA systems, doesn't necessarily like BA systems all the time and vice versa. And, you know, the um, monopoly monopsony relationship is always, is always difficult, but there is a, a good level of understanding, a good level of collaboration, um, it, you know, a, an industrial strategy that is configured to deal with that type of an actor. It, it's very different when you're starting to talk about, you know, dual use technologies that come from universities or multinational corporations that maybe have, don't even have any idea that their technology is relevant to defense or, or if it is relevant to defense, they don't necessarily care that much because defense is a very small customer, you know, so it's harder for defense to exert influence. So yeah, I think procurement is getting harder and harder and harder for, think, and making those intelligent decisions is hard. Yeah, I mean, Nick, Nicholas, you had your hand up. Yeah. yeah no, what I would, I think you know, it's easy to get sidetracked by cyber. I, I think the recognition is not that we devote an enormous percentage of the budget towards cyber, but just recognizing actually this is an important area, we've got to invest in it, but proportionally. Um, and, and if we look at the division of the budget, I think what's really 
putting the whole thing under pressure is the renewal of our nuclear capability because that's just sucking enormous quantities of money. Because what I didn't realize until you know, late last year is that we're not just renewing the submarines, we're actually renewing the missiles, we're upgrading the D5 um, Trident. Uh, and so that the cost is just horrendous. Um, and really, if, if, you, you know, if, if we did not have a nuclear deterrent, then we could easily invest in the army. Um, but, but actually, I think it's right that we do invest in the nuclear deterrent because we're sending a very clear message to China. You know, if this goes wrong in a big way and you, you know, we, we can still equal you because we have the ultimate deterrent and that doesn't end well for anyone. Yeah, thank you. Patrick? I, I, I was just going to interject that we have been slightly harsh um, on the various documents. We should perhaps to acknowledge that um, the Chief of Defence Staff and, and the, the Secretary said, I think must be the first for, first pairing for some time that have actually secured an increased budget. And if they did that by telling Porky Pies about where they're going to spend the money in cyber or whatever, um, while the Treasury might not like it, I would imagine the rest of the, 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 rest of the government departments are watching, watching on with awe and wonder. Yeah, it's a good point about um, nuclear weapons, actually. The, 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 new, what the government's commitment on nuclear weapons has actually been somewhat inaccurately reported as an increase. It's a commitment to increase to a certain number, and that's not quite accurate. The government has committed that it, it has raised the maximum number of nuclear weapons that it may sustain. And a cynic could say, um, you know, what, what the government could do is actually change nothing it doesn't increase its number of nuclear weapons it just says that it could raise that maximum if it wanted to That'd be a very efficient way of raising your deterrence without actually uh, procuring new weapons and it's a bit like the commitment to have at least one nuclear armed submarine on station at all times well that's a you know you don't have to do that it's just in secret you don't have to keep one on station all the time in order to, uh, as long as the your adversaries don't have insight into how many submarines you actually do have on station, as long as they think that you could have at least one, you've got the same deterrent without actually investing in the material cost, right? So uh, I think you know, nuclear weapons might be an efficient, I think, uh, it, personally, I agree with Nicholas. I think this is very important. The government should be investing in it and it's way overdue. It's way overdue in the United States, actually, for the same reason it's been overdue in the west and britain is uh, catching up with the united states which is belated as it is but i think you can also you can also say you know deterrence is one of those areas where you can um, you can do a lot of bait and switch and a lot of fakery so you can get you can get efficient deterrence by promising uh, ra raising the uncertainty about how much you're actually acquiring beyond what you really do if that makes sense. Does anybody want to add anything on that? I think just to say that some of this is also invariably probably deeply practical and boring. You know, it's 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 doing things like the fact that, as you say, they are replacing the warheads. There will be a transition period where you are, you know, just handling and disposing of older and bring in newer. And, and so there will be certain periods where you actually have a little bit of a bulge in, in a number of um, warheads and stuff that you might have and things like that are, are other sorts of explanations. So I think I think you're right that there's some, you know, there are some potential benefits from kind of creative ambiguity in your signaling around the deterrence. Uh, and different nations take quite different approaches to that. Um, yeah, the US is fairly kind of blunt about what it has and what sort of things it targets and whatever in the way that the US, the UK isn't. Um, but there also there's, there's invariably, you know, prosaic drivers behind some of this as well, I'm sure. Yeah, James, I want to go back to something James mentioned earlier, which was that, the, that Russia and other states um, have a doctrine of intervening at critical nodes or, or critical personnel. And one of the potential targets for a country like Russia uh, of, as a group of personnel could be the pilots who were certified to fly the planes that would be the only planes that could drop an air delivered nuclear weapon and uh, it was reported this was some years ago it was reported that you know there was there was like a dozen pilots in the ref who were actually certified to do that and if you could 
if you could stop them getting to work, you could eliminate that part of the nuclear deterrent. Um, is there anything else that uh, any of you are concerned about as a critical node or a critical capability or some critical link in the system that is vulnerable to that sort of targeting? I think one of the surprise, I'm not surprising, but I, I suppose one of the slightly more standout points from the command paper, when you when you look at the world talk about global persistent engagement and forces being forward, you know, forward deployed and moving around a lot and being agile and so on, is obviously the increased pressure on lift, at least in the, the short term, um, both in terms of, okay, getting rid of C-130J, but you know, presumably offsetting that by increased availability for the A400M, although it is a, a bigger aircraft and, and so does do slightly different things in certain situations. Um, and then and then kind of consolidating the median rotary lift um, and, and looking to bring in new helicopters there. You know, that, that is a bit of a pinch point potentially, I suppose, is, is if we are going to be deployed around the world in lots of places, you know, getting there, supporting that, sustaining that is, is always going to be tough. And there is always a... You know, there's always a slight tendency to focus on the tea farms and forget all the kind of support stuff that goes behind it, but that's obviously all, all crucial. But I would I would say related to that is the question of um, you know securing the homeland, some of which comes down to kind of you know air and missile defence, for example. You know, there is a lot of there's there's a fair bit of talk in the command paper about growing missile threats, not so much talk about missile defence um, in specific terms. You know, there's there's some general commitments to look at more kind of missile air and missile defense capabilities including organic ones for the army when they're deployed um but there's a real question you know around how much we can secure the homeland from long-range threats how much we can secure certain key points of embarkation or disembarkation um because you know there's a small number of air, airfields and ports and so on for which everything will flow in any major conflict and really securing those against threats is, is, is going to be a big challenge and, and you only have to go back to the you know, the Gatwick incident in 2019. And, and, you know, I know that was obviously not in a conflict, but, you know, that was an example of an entire international airport being closed down by, you know, a hobbyist with a, a drone making a nuisance of themselves. Um, or you, you can look at what the Iranians and uh, their proxies in Yemen have managed to achieve in Saudi with pretty cheap and cheerful, you know, missiles and drones against Patriot miss, uh, air defense systems. You know, they've they've blown up all sorts of oil you know oil facilities and, and military uh, positions. So you know there's a real question I suppose around that, and, and related to that is not just the defensive side, but also the offensive side of fires is just munitions, numbers of munitions. Do we have the? Um, you know we've talked about do we have enough, enough people and platforms to sustain a long term high end war fight? But there's a big question also of just do we have enough rounds uh, and complex weapons and stuff to go with that. Because you, in, in a high-end fight, if we're going to be degrading um, you know, enemy air defences and we're going to be trying to win the deep battle and so on, you're going to need vast amounts of these things, um, all of which cost money. And, and generally speaking, the MOD doesn't like to spend money on stuff that is kind of lying around. Um, it's not lying around. It's there you know, in, in readiness for when you might need it in the future. But... Um, it's harder to kind of justify that sort of stuff sometimes if you're going to be ultimately putting in a warehouse in Germany or somewhere else. Yeah, okay, thank you, James. So I think we're moving now down into the list of things that um, the integrated review might be criticized for neglecting or under-emphasizing or um, perhaps just not talking about, doesn't want to talk about at all for reasons of deniability or secrecy or whatever it is. Um, uh, I do want to bring in um, Nicholas to talk particularly about the army before Nicholas has to go. I think there's a there's a segue here. We have to get through the many men mentions of things like climate change, green new deals, uh, biodiversity, net zero. So climate, the word climate comes up 90 times in the integrated review. Green, biodiversity each come up 32 times. Um, now, I recognize those things are, are important, but... This is the problem with an integrated review. You start talking about things which are very, very important to departments of international aid and foreign policy offices, uh, foreign offices, but um, they tend to then subsume the defense and security part. Um, 
even though biosecurity is part of our overall security, there is a, there is a tendency for these things to 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 to, to subsume the the nitty gritty of just defense and security, and that that inter, at least intellectually and then materially, that can be counterproductive. So if you can't um, if you can't uh, secure the unstable, fragile states that are collapsing into environmental disaster with your armed forces, your emphasis on climate change in your civilian government looks a bit silly, for instance. So is there anything anybody wants to say quickly on that part, that heavy emphasis in the IR on the wider sort of climate, um, green, net zero type stuff? No. Uh, I, I can speak very quickly. I mean, Ram, Ram's been doing work supporting um, Lieutenant General Richard Nugy, who's releasing a kind of defence, you know, climate um, policy or strategy or strategic approach. I can't, I can't remember what it's called, um, but that's that's all in the public domain. Um, I, I, I think it is absolutely something that directly affects defence and security. I think where the emphasis has shifted in the MOD in the last however many years is, is it's gone from talking about climate from a kind of sustainability perspective of you know the the you know we must use the defense of states put up a, a, you know more trees and solar panels and, and whatever all of which you know is is perfectly worthy and good and, and useful but isn't um kind of specifically benefiting the military it's just benefiting the nation or benefiting the, the you know the climate um, it's shifting to focusing more on how embracing certain technologies associated with greening the economy might actually benefit defense. And I mean, one, you know, one example is, um, you know, it, increasing use of renewable energy sources or electric vehicles and so on in certain theaters that thereby reduces the reliance on you know fossil fuels which have to be shipped in and you have to have you know tankers you have to protect them you have to have force protection and all the other stuff or there's you know more talk about having autonomous systems for say mine hunting that again um perhaps can run off you know they're, they're run off electricity that can be from whatever sort of renewable source you want it might actually be cheaper in the long term to operate and there are fewer broader requirements to support people uh, or put people in danger in the way that um, you get with a man platform. So there are certain kind of broader military and operational and tactical benefits you can get from some of these technologies. I think the MOD, though, is at the same time recognizing that those are always going to be secondary to getting the military's core job done. And the core job is to go and you know, fight and defeat the Queen's enemies. And so it's, it's, it's framing it as going green where that benefits the military rather than kind of going green at the expense of the military. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about um, greenifying the army, um, and we are not going to use battery battery electric tanks anytime soon. And we the no, only exactly. way we're going to green greenify the army is through a hydrogen economy, and we will not do that until there's a whole commercial uh, infrastructure and to generate um, green hydrogen at scale. So really, it's it, it for the moment. I think it's an irrelevant discussion because the technology is just not there yet. I, I absolutely agree, but I'd go further and say, if anything is symptomatic of a, an armed force that has not got a grip of its intellectual development, it's that rather than concentrating on killing Her Majesty's enemies, which is what they're there for, they're chasing a, head, a headline on going green. The, the, there's nothing about any single piece of military equipment that means it's going to be the launch platform for a green technology because they need to stay specified. They need to get on and do what they do and allow for the, the renewable energy and the green and the everything else to catch up with them. Yeah. I mean, I have to say, having seen US DOD, Department of Defense, start this conversation about greening its own fuel supplies, this started 10 years ago, and it wasn't framed as this would be good for the planet. It was framed as this would be cheaper and more efficient for the military. That if, that if it um, had more electrical power, it wouldn't have to deliver heavy and risky, um, uh, uh, difficult to handle fuels uh, as much to the, to the front line. The, the, the USDOD is much more 
I think, pragmatic and um, in advance of the MOD on that particular issue. Um, maybe we can move on. Nicholas, I want to stick with you because you have to go in a few minutes. Let's get to the army. Let's talk about what you think, start us off um, on what you think are the critical deficiencies or inattentions in these documents to what the army needs in the future. Um, what was very refreshing about the document is it reported the investment in artillery. And, and unless we do that, and at scale, we're going to struggle to have uh, and to deliver strike. Um, a lot of people thought strike was dead because it didn't get a mention in the paper, but it's still, you know, I've spoken to people since, and it's very much alive. But if we're going to deliver it, then we have to invest in tube artillery, uh, in rocket artillery, in missile artillery, loitering munitions, and air defense. And that's a lot of areas to have to invest in. And I'm not sure that 1.25 billion over the next 10 years is anywhere near enough. So we absolutely need to invest there. Um, I, I don't like the idea of having two maneuver brigades in a division. Uh, I think you need to have three. And I think we need two deployable divisions. And I think everything that we should have done for the army should have been about um, configuring two deployable divisions and, and resourcing them. Um, I like the idea of brigade combat teams. I thought that was, that was good. Um, I think that the heavy brigade combat team is about using what we've got rather than deliberately setting out to, to design a, a force structure that meets our needs. So lumping Ajax, Challenger 3 and Boxer in the same formation did not make sense to me. Uh, and I think we'll have to rethink that. Um, at the light end of a scale, there was no mention of the MRVP vehicle, the light armored vehicle. Uh, and we're gonna need a lot of those if we're gonna deliver light protected forces that are mobile and agile. So those are the key areas that I would, um, I would highlight in the discussion. Yeah, thank you. I think um, just to give some other parameters I've read, uh, I mean, you, Nicholas, you're talking about almost two armor divisions. So we've, we've got two, two divisions that the MOD plans to be deployable first and third, and uh, they're, they, sort of, they have some tanks. They're sort of part armored divisions. Um, now for, for, for a very critical party, a party like UKIP, which has a strong position on defense, most small parties, don't have much policy on defense. So UKIP is saying, essentially you need two armor divisions. That's six, uh, it wants six tank battalions, three tank battalions per division. It wants two proper armor divisions. We don't have proper armor divisions anymore. Um, uh, so is that is that where you, what you imply we should be aiming for when you talk about um, no, I, I think one armor division is fine and one light division is fine. Uh, I think any notion of a force deploying on foot now is gone. You've got to have some kind of protected mobility. Um, and so what, what you do with air assault forces once they're on the ground is a big question. I think you've got to put them in some kind of protected vehicle, however light it is. Um, but at the heavy end, uh, you know, I, I think three tank regiments plus a training regiment or 200 tanks would be fine. I think 150 is just a bit too few. Uh, so I, I would have um, a, a armored brigade with probably one tank regiment, one reconnaissance regiment, and, and three... Um, ...make the armored brigade all wheel the necessary. That's something that's been discussed. Yeah, and I think the army still. Can I, can I just time. ask you to? Can I just ask you, you to repeat that? Because you said three, and then the transmission cut out. So what was the three? Um, so we should have three tank regiments, not not two. The, the plan at the moment is two, and I think that's just too few. So we could get there with two hundred tanks, which gives you enough for three regular regiments and a training regiment and some reserve. But I, I think if you go once you go below that, it's probably not worth having them. And if you if you decide that you're just going to have it at such a low level, you might as well ask yourself: Can we spend the money better on something else? Right, Patrick, you're a former tanker, tanky. So I was a tanker 
in the US yeah. economy. You were tanky. What, what, what do you think? Um, I thought the decision to get rid of Warrior lock, stock, and barrel. At first, at first, my eyes sort of fell out on stock, but I think that's a very ballsy but justifiable position. Uh, and we talked last time to, de to death about the, the dangers of putting yourself into less than less than MBT levels of armor. I think I think that works. I worry, and I worry increasingly uh, um, since then about. Let's say we did actually have to go and deploy an armored division for a couple of years. How do we do that? Let's say we just had to go and deploy, uh, you know, a, a self-sustaining heavy boxer brigade. Um, how do we do that? How do we roll the people through? I mean, one of the things we got massively wrong in Afghanistan was trying to rotate brigades through every six months. Um, but it seems to me, and I share Nicholas's observation that a dismounted infantryman is a corpse looking for a grave on, a, on the modern battlefield. Um, it, see, it seems to me that there is an opportunity for saying, OK, we've currently got two infantry battalions, one of whom's in box in Warrior, who are going to get nice shiny new boxes, um, and the other one's dismounted. Hey, guys, share the damn vehicles. And you're always going back to the Kabul world, we've got two battalions, they're sharing one set of kit, one of them goes off overseas, and then we switch them, but we know that they know each other well enough to be able to switch going forward, and that probably answers the question, what's happened to a lightweight armoured vehicle? What's the bloody point of a light? Um, that gets hard for tanks because we haven't got enough regiments but the same argument holds true and the same thing could be done and indeed the whole you know the whole fleet management approach make, make, makes it very, very easy at the moment we're going to you know if we if we deploy and the war doesn't come at the appropriate moment everyone's going to be away on r and r there are going to be family crises we're going to add a manpower and no one's looking at sustainability which is well, probably because they're not looking at yeah, that's a good point. I mean, if you've got three units and you've really only got two because you've, the third is a training unit, you have to deploy over a sustained sustain period of time, like years, as in Iraq, Afghanistan. You can really only deploy one at a time, right? The, the, it's a rule of threes. One is going out, preparing to go out. One is out and one is coming back, resting. Um, so two is a real risk in operational terms as well as intellectual terms because then you've got a very small manpower pool personnel pool i should say to 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 promote from um james have you got anything on on this particular issue uh i mean on the the personnel issue i suppose um i mean one of one of the ways you can start to kind of increase your mass whilst having you know ever fewer people is obviously to try and make more use of um, unmanned systems. It, I, certainly the army has been thinking about that. It's obviously had autonomous warrior and other sorts of experimentation activities ongoing. Um, the kind of infantry trials unit, arm, arm trials unit have been doing bits and pieces around that. There wasn't, however, a, a huge emphasis on that in this command paper. Um, and we did actually see probably more emphasis from, from the Navy and the Air Force. And I mean, certainly the Navy has been doing a lot with Navy X and Project Nelson and Marworks and, and others um, to, tr to try and understand how they integrate into that domain. The, the, the RAF Rapid Capability Office has got the kind of Mosquito and, and uh, Lancer or, or Lanka um, programs going on for, for our man systems. And they're both pretty actively trying to increase the overall mass of the force without having many people. Um, we didn't we didn't see similar kind of overt commitments from the army really here. There was a bit of talk about automating the mobile fires platform, whatever whatever that may be. Um, so maybe that it's just the army judges that the technology is not quite there yet for, for the land domain, which is inherently more um, kind of cluttered and complex because it's got terrain and it's got people and it's got civilians and, and all these other things that don't really exist in the, the sea or the air domains in the same way. But that was perhaps, a, I guess, a slight surprise in a document that was otherwise um, kind of resplendent with references to technology and innovation and AI and, and you know robotics. Um, on on the broader point about yeah personnel and cycling them through, um, I mean that's certainly certainly a question again for the kind of global persistent engagement. You know, if we are going to be deploying people overseas more often. Um, 
whether for capacity building or, or training or kind of some of the sub threshold stuff that the new ranger regiments are, are supposed to be doing what that does you know what, what pressures that puts on the overall um army community uh, and broader families and everything i, I don't know um so oh, oh, oh we're losing nicholas yeah nicholas has to go thank you nicholas any final comments yep yeah, yeah, right yeah no a, a really good discussion thanks for having me yeah see you soon thank you nicholas james sorry go ahead well i was just gonna say that you know that raises questions and obviously there is a uh, one, of, one of the things we haven't obviously talked about yet is kind of special operations special and special forces. And there is obviously a growing emphasis on both um, in, in the IR and in the command paper, you know, recognizing that as an area of strength, but also implicitly noting that the high kind of tempo operations and the strains and stresses of that on the actual UK special forces. So the, uh, the SAS, the SBS, the, the SAR, the SRR and, and the support group. Um, is, is sufficiently taxing that there's this need to kind of expand the role of the Royal Marines in this kind of future commando force. And then these new, this new Army Special Operations Brigade, which in the short term is kind of rebranding, you know, for extant um, units, uh, but in the long term will be, you know, selective and, and whatever. Um, that's an interesting development. But again, there's some questions, I suppose, if you are the UK's larger allies and partners who have... You know, if you're the US military, for example, um, of which the, you know, the Ranger regiments are clearly modeled upon, given the name, um, how, how credible a kind of high end special operations force can you generate with a force of 72,500 people will be, you know, something for debate. So it puts a lot of pressure on the training and the education and the development activities within the army to continue to deliver a qualitative edge given the dwindling kind of quantitative um, scale of the, the organization. Yeah, I have to say, I'm going to point out now that there are some um, very strange errors in the command paper, particularly. So the I, I've said earlier that the force structure is, is underspecified. There's also some contra contradictions. So I shared with you all my email because I had a question about it, there was a statement about all the infantry being restructured in four infantry divisions. That's literally what it says. And of course, we only have two plus one divisions of which that plus one, that third division is really a, a signals electronic warfare division. So it's strange that these, these errors, yeah, right, these errors creep into what's supposed to be a command paper. And we're left trying to work out what's an error, what's a what's maybe a deliberate sleight of hand to not give too much away to whoever shouldn't be reading too much into, into our policy documents. Um, but it, it, it worries me that there are these errors and there's this under specificity. And it begs the question, has the MOD really finished its thinking on what the full structure should be before it published this command paper? Patrick? Right, okay. Regiments of infantry um, are a, sorry, divisions of infantry um, are, as opposed to infantry divisions. A division of infantry is a grouping of regiments with a similar heritage. So it's a light division, the Queen's division, the King division, and it's entirely part of the regimental system. Um, I think it was almost certainly put in by either a confused civil servant or a rather mischievous staff officer who wanted to spread obfuscation rather than a detailed detail quick count up of James's excellent point is that half your infantry is effectively special forces. Are those special forces as special as they were when there were merely 2% of your infantry? And um, um, there we go. I, I, I don't think there are any errors per se. I think there are yawing chasms of lack of thought or lack of evidence of which when well, we haven't talked about it, so we might as well do that now, which is counting an aviation brigade as a manoeuvre unit in a division. It was tried once in Iraq too by the Americans who, let's face it, do helicopters somewhat better um, and more lavishly than the British Army, and it failed badly. 
Um, and yet we seem to have it in there. And I'm damn sure those helicopters are double counted from somewhere else. But yeah, think, yeah, James. Well, I, I was just going to say. I mean, you referenced the US, and, and then uh, Patrick, and then and then Bruce. You said, um, yeah, there are, there are certain areas where it seems like things may not have been kind of finalized. Um, I mean, I, obviously nothing is ever final and these, you know, these concepts continue to, to evolve. I think what, what is noteworthy is it's not just the UK that's going through a lot of shift in its broader kind of thinking about concepts of operations and consequently about capabilities and force structures. You know, we're also seeing that at the NATO level, we're seeing it in the US. You know, there's a lot of big changes happening in the US at the moment as they shift towards firstly what they were calling multi-domain operations um, and now it's joint all domain operations or, or JDO or, or joint all domain command and control. Um, you know, the UK is kind of going on a similar journey. It's got the new um, joint concept note around multi-domain integration, which is our kind of anglicization of the multi-domain operations terminology. Um, and that's all predicated on the idea that, you know, in future, it's not about just joint operations. Um, it's, well, it's certainly not about operations in any one domain, but, it, you know, it hasn't been for many, 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 many years. Um, it's not just about joint operations or getting the different services work together. It's actually about what they're calling multi-domain operations, which is really blurring the line, the traditional lines and, and stovepipes between the different domains and services, which all, you know, sounds great. And there are some, you know, some good arguments and thinking behind that. But it's also very complex, both in a technical standpoint, because it goes back to the point we were making earlier about everything will be networks, everything's going to be, you know, there's vast amounts of data moving around, it's got to be secure, you've got the enemy trying to, to stop all that, that of cyber and electronic and, and other means. But it's also not just a technical challenge, it's a, it's a broader kind of procedural and tactical challenge. You know, how do you do joint planning and joint operations in that sort of kind of dizzyingly complex, multi-domain future conflict where you know, you've got some junior commander who's having to bring together you know, army assets, navy assets, air assets, space assets, cyber, it's, and, and converge and synchronize all those different effects and operations in different domains. Really, really tricky. And, and the answer is not there yet. Like, you know, the, the US is only just starting to invest in its, um, it, yeah, its new joint or domain command and control to figure out all of the practicalities of how that works. And it's, and it's still experimenting with what, you know, multi-domain task force should look like what size should they be? What contributions should different services make? I, I can't remember who said earlier, but there was, you know, we mentioned there's this question of what will the army do in the Indo-Pacific? The US is grappling with the exact same, exact same questions. You know, the US Army is trying to figure out what role it plays against China in a domain in a in a conflict scenario that's probably going to be heavily dominated by maritime and air. Um, very unlike, say, Russia, which is much more likely to be dominated by you know, la the land domain. Um, so I, I guess in the defense of the UK for not having kind of fully thought through all of these kind of fairly revolutionary concepts, I, I don't think anyone else has yet either. Uh, and, and it, you know, the UK is certainly working closely with the US and NATO to try and progress their thinking um, and is probably ahead of most NATO countries in thinking about this. But is it finished? Absolutely not. Is this a work in progress? Yes. And are there lots of uncertain questions around, you know, specific capabilities um, like, you know, fires or ISR or lift or autonomous systems? Absolutely. Um, but I think it's it would be a real challenge now at this kind of inflection point in technology and in the threat and in the, the kind of concepts of operations to really pin things down. But so, so if we can't give a final answer, I guess the question, from, the most personal question for me is, does the force structure that they've set out in the command paper give them kind of enough flexibility for the future that they still have certain choices open to them? Or by cutting certain things and investing in other things, do you close off certain choices that might not be there in five years' time because you've lost some of the capability that you once had? I think that's, that's probably the, the metric it needs to be judged on. Yeah, I, I agree with you. You referenced the US there, and there's there's... Um, two ways to think about the US example. So, um, you know, it, it is true that even the US is struggling through, struggling to work out 
the best configuration of formations that it has been struggling with since the 1990s. However, the flip side of that is that the, the British MOD has the chance to learn from the US acting as a sec, essentially with second mover advantage. So the US was the first mover, it has more of the pain. Britain has, as a second mover, less of the pain. Um, and that's particularly true on brigade combat teams. All right, so brigade combat teams, the US Army uh, formalized those in time for the 2003 invasion of Iraq where they got severely tested and a lot of things were exposed, particularly going back to an earlier point, the lightness of the striker vehicles, like the striker brigade was too, it was not sufficiently survivable, at least for Iraq. Um, and the MOD, the British MOD has the advantage of learning as a second mover on those sorts of things. So in that sense, we could expect Britain, the British MOD to be more um, advanced in its thinking about at the brigade formation level, the brigade echelon by 2021, even though the US is still working some things out. Um, and, you know, I, I think we're talking about the brigade echelon now. I mean, we've got the brigade combat teams to talk about. There are, there are the heavy type in the, in the latest uh, command paper. There's a light type. Um, but we've also got these new brigades to talk about, the Special Ops Brigade, the Security Force Assistance Brigade, and as Patrick mentioned, this Combat Aviation Brigade, which is going to be combined with the Legacy Air Assault Brigade as this global response force. Um, the only one of those brigades I've seen specified before Nicholas helped us privately with, with some speculation offline. The only one that's really specified is, is the Special Ops Brigade. And it's not really specified except in the sense it's gonna have four units and they're gonna do an awful lot of things. Like they're gonna do uh, light infantry uh, force assistance. They're gonna do, um, um, they're gonna do, they're gonna have cyber and uh, electronic warfare capabilities. Um, you know, there's, those brigades, at the brigade echelon, I think we've got the most uncertainty. Am I, am I wrong about that? I think, I, I, I think there's a lot of confusion of slapping things together into a chain of command so that um, colonels have brigadiers to report to. I can't imagine us deploying a special forces brigade to the same place. Because if we're sending that much stuff we must be going up the, the conflict threshold very quickly. And I think that's probably more an administrative training sort of organization um, than it is being, being seen as something that's going to fight as a maneuver unit. Right. Um, I think if I could just wind the clock back, the comparison with the British Army and the perhaps the American Army is the difference is the American Army is bloody good at what it does and it knows it's very good at what it does. And the British Army has lost that. And the question I suppose about this review is that, it, we, is it painting over the cracks in the hope that in about five years time we'll land somewhere that look, looks credible, which rather begs the question, where are we gonna go and train people? Because who's gonna ask for us? Because they want the, they want the varsity, which would be the Americans or possibly the French with their Francophone. Um, or are we trying to do two things simultaneously, which is one, remember what we've forgotten, which is the whole deep strike maneuver warfare mission command approach um, that, that effect, effectively died in the counterinsurgency campaigns. And at the same time, have a look forward to where we spend money on the hardware. And I think we're trying to do that, which explains why you don't say, yep, we need a new tank or, uh, and we certainly didn't say, no, we can't do tanks anymore. So, so there is either, we're marking time while we get our act together, or there's great uncertainty about what the future looks like, or it's a case of we need to do it a bit better, but we'll get there in the end. Yeah, well, let, let's let's go through these brigades um, quickly. So, Patrick, you've already mentioned this new combat aviation brigade. Um, you're skeptical about that, and I think I share some of the skepticism. I'm interested to hear what James has to say about that brigade. And let's move through them and make comment on each of these new brigades, including the brigade combat teams. But let's start with the combat aviation brigade. James, what do you think? I mean, certainly there's always a need for more 
uh, and, and I mean the you know the lack of helicopters and so on in the UK um, is is well documented. Um, there's obviously you know there are some big programs happening in the US at the moment, like Future Vertical Lift, which you know I'm sure the UK is, is watching closely, and there's you know potential opportunities to benefit some from some great economies of scale and bring in new uh, platforms over the kind of medium term that offer something materially different in terms of speed, range, persistence, uh, but also, you know, cost, survivability, et cetera. So what this looks like in the medium term, I don't know. I think it, it depends a lot on some of those big platform choices. Um, in terms of the kind of battlefield re relevance of that type of force, that type of capability, I mean, clearly it's it's an enduring one. Mobility and agility are, you know, obviously going to be key to survivability in a um, in a situation where we have all of the kind of long range and uh, precision fires and, and stuff that we talked about from the enemy, uh, and at the same time we don't have vast number of forces or much mass on our end. So clearly, you know, the ability to disperse and concentrate your forces at at speed and at range, and to do so in as um, low signature away as possible is going to be useful in a lot of different scenarios i think the yeah the the, the the again the challenge is always around mass it's just how sustainable and survivable is that force in a high-end war fight for how long um and if the answer is it not very long <laughs> then um you know what what else do you do instead um are you just deterred from deploying certain forces into certain environments in which case that's not great um or are you are you able to do something differently with different types of forces? Which I think is where we're starting to drive towards that special operations type discussion in, in the, the other brigade, which, yeah, as Patrick said, is not kind of a maneuver brigade, presumably, but um, rather just a you know training organization. But the there is that there is that increasing focus from the Marines as well as the army on kind of smaller, highly lethal um highly agile small units that are operating and then you know shoot and scoot um whether that then be with aviation or whether that then be they get in some you know some rigid hull boats and, and bomb it down the river um it, it kind of depends on which one you're talking about um but that's a real shift and again that's kind of what the u.s marine corps are doing at the moment is you know moving away from large forces doing joint theater entry um towards you know, small units, small groups of units kind of operating semi-independently and just making as much mischief as they can, um, call, either calling in kind of air and missile strikes or using, you know, their organic capabilities. Um, I know that takes your aviation question and makes it a bit broader, but I think that's probably the context that I, I responded it to it in, is it's kind of how does this in, play into the other types of decisions that have been made in this command paper? Because obviously, in, in and of itself, the answer is always you want more. <laughs> you, yeah. you know, you always want more lift. That's clearly the answer. Uh, it's just if you can't have that, how do you configure your force slightly differently to still achieve effect? Is is interesting. Yeah, I mean, the, the the analogy with the United States is 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 somewhat nuanced in that, yes, the U.S. is using smaller packets of forces. But at the same time, it starts with a much larger force. So the, the, the whole yes. of, uh, Special Operations Command is about the size of what the army will be after it's been cut, the whole of the British Army. It's much easier for the Special Operations Command to package down and, and handle the rotation of personnel and, and the readiness of personnel and those other sustainment issues when it starts with around 70,000 Special Operators um, then yeah. the British Army is talking about a single brigade, the Security Force Assistance Brigade, and a single Special Ops Brigade, which is, as I mentioned privately, it, that's, it's even a misleading brigade because it's specifying units at 250 men. So that brigade is really a glorified battalion. Um, you're going to package very small parts of that, you know, dozens of trainers, perhaps, dozens of liaison officers, dozens of observers. Um, it, it, it doesn't offer the sort of depth that you would need to, to sustain big operations. It's really, what are you sustaining? You'd be able to sustain peacetime uh, liaison and training. Uh, am I wrong? 
No. I mean, I think, yeah, I, th I think it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, for start, it's an important distinction, obviously, between special operations and special forces, which are, you know, obviously not the same, although it's been not necessarily reported as that in the media. Um, but I think a lot of it is, you know, it's a, as it says, it's kind of about relieving pressure on the real high end special forces so they can focus on the things that they do best and or which we most need them to do. Um, and some of these still arduous, still risky, but slightly less specialist activities can be taken on by bits of hitherto the regular army. Um, I, I can understand the logic there. I think you're right that, yeah, it's 250 men times four is obviously an interesting um, definition of a, a brigade. Um, in terms of the, uh, if, are they enough to generate the effect you want to deliver? I think the, I think again, this comes back to the point in the command paper about everything being allied by design as the new, you know, we've had international by design used to be the watchword, it's now allied by design. It's, you know, the UK is not necessarily suggesting that the army in particular is, um, is intended to be a kind of sufficient response to all threats. It's a contribution to a coalition response. I think, it, you know, the, the UK has a fair bit of sovereign capability and freedom of action in the air and maritime domains. We talked about cyber, not so much space, but it's very low baseline. You know, the, the army that it's describing here is configured to provide kind of niche areas of specialization to a broader NATO force rather than to do large scale fighting on its own. It, you know, it's not, it just doesn't have the depth and the breadth. To, it does have a kind of full spectrum of capability, but it just doesn't have the mass to, you know, to be doing, as you said, multi-divisional, you know, deployments for any period of time. Um, course, it's not what this is about. Yeah, Patrick. Of course, there's also a, a, a big difference. You know, if you're a US special forces or special operations type person, whoever your enemy name is, knows that behind you stands the entire weight of the formidable United States military. If you're the British guy, that, that weight isn't there. If it goes wrong, it's going to go wrong badly and nothing's going to get you out. I think, I think we've been hung up on it, um, Tirana. I My initial thinking was that with these four battalion, nominal battalions, but their cadres say, say, you know, you lose that you lose manpower. I can see them saying, okay, one of you lot go off and learn Arabic. Anything that happens in Arabia, you're going to be the guys on the ground. You're going to secure the corner of the airfield where some other people called Dave are going to come through. Some of you go and learn Spanish, Swahili for you lot. And um, you, guys, you guys dip, you get to learn Chinese. I, I, I can see that sort of making sense and giving a, a a, a, an integral territorial expertise for what's been forced to become or been seen as becoming an expeditionary armed forces to go out. And, and I think their role may very well be to go and find out and say, who do we bribe if we need to get a big convoy of stuff through here without having to fight our way there? And, and that sort of makes more sense than um yeah they're quite cool soldiers but they're not as good as the sas and um well it's a bit classified anyway um i mean that's yeah building on the model of the so that it's on this the um security assistant forces brigade i mean that that's the model they're building on from the last couple of years yeah. um experimenting with the um kind of specialized infantry battalions i think they are um or units which again are those kind of regionally territorially linked um units where you say, okay, you're in Cyprus, you have responsibility for the Middle East, you, you know, learn about the key players, you're the ones that are going to go do all of the joint kind of training and exercises, um, or at least facilitate those, because often we might bring in other forces if it's a large-scale exercise. Build those relationships, build the understanding, obviously acclimatize and understand the tactics of relevance to that, you know, desert environment or cold environment or whatever. Um, and then, yeah, you'll be the kind of gatekeepers for that relationship that if we then have to deploy something on mass into to that um that theater you'll give us that expertise those connections and so on um which is yeah kind of where the security assistance force brigade seems to be heading is, is scaling that model up and obviously um making more of these certain regional hubs so it, you know it talks about east africa it talks about cyprus it talks about Oman. and then talks about you know east asia um and the five power defense arrangement yeah. and, and so on yeah, so look, uh, I think we should we should close. Um, just take a few minutes to 
um, evaluate the brigade combat teams. There isn't much in the command paper. There's a little more in this future soldier document that James, you've shared around. So I guess I should start with you, James, and then we'll go to Patrick. Uh, what do you think of these new brigade combat teams, um, of which there's three actually mentioned only two types. There's the heavy type of which there'll be two. There's, there'll be two light BCTs and there's this new deep reconnaissance strike BCT. So let's see three types, five brigade combat teams across those three types. So James, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Nicholas mentioned, I think it was Nicholas mentioned early on that I think this makes us the only large NATO country to have um, divisions where you'll have two maneuver brigades when it comes to kind of armed war fighting, which it is obviously, well, either an innovation or, um, you know, controversy, depending on your, your point of view on that. Um, you know, I, I don't know enough about it to, to formulate an, a strong opinion on, on which way, you know, which the two it is. Um, I think, you know, as you said, shifting to, to BCTs makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways, and it does give us the opportunity to, to leverage some of the learning that the US um, has, has been doing around structuring that. Um, I think Patrick said earlier that, you know, it, it, uh, a major part, obviously, of this restructuring is then some platform decisions and... Um, you know, we can debate whether there's enough challenger, but there is going to be some challenger. It's, you know, it's been labeled the challenger three, but it isn't actually a new tank. It's just obviously a you know, challenger 2.5. Um, there are some, you know, there are some positives about the, the upgrades that will give more of a capability, obviously, if with fewer hulls. Um, getting rid of Warrior, yeah, as Patrick, as Patrick said, you know, potentially makes sense. How you then integrate that with, with Ajax and Boxer is interesting. And, and I know in some of the documents, um, including the, the, the Army's paper on future command land system, uh, future land combat system, there's all sorts of kind of icons that have had all sorts of, you know, defense anoraks such as ourselves squinting to try and work out what vehicle that, you know, that icon denotes and whether it's a, you know, new Boxer variant with a, you know, different turret or, or whatever. And I think a lot more detail will probably come in the 2020s as we, we figure out in reality how those different vehicles, both wheeled and tracked, are going to work together. Um, but in broad principle, yeah, moving to BCTs, you can, you can see the logic. Patrick. Yeah. Um, yes, interesting. Um, I mean, brigade combat teams as such aren't really that new because a brigade always used to be a fairly flexible all arms grouping with its own, quite light, but with its own admin error. The, 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 the immediate days of combat supplies um, were there. And if we're playing around and saying, well, we haven't got a division, so let's send a brigade, and we're almost back to sustainability point. If we're going to go, are we all going until we get tired and get bored? Um, or are we going to go in a sustainable way? And, and I, I think that's inevitable. It will be interesting to see how they work out, for instance, what on earth goes into the, the, the ISR brigade. I mean, if you're a brigade commander and you're punching there, then you want your own ISR because you need the lines of communications, you need the clarity of view so everyone's on the same hymn sheet. Um, which we were, as we've discussed, could well already be under threat due to cyber electronic warfare and a gazillion other things that might go wrong. And what goes where is going to be going to be quite interesting. Um, I don't see what you do with an ISR brigade by itself. I mean, are you, you know, where's the strike coming from? You know, are you going to be dropping? clever munitions off a very, very expensive F-35, which has a huge logistic footprint, because everyone forgets about the tankers and the maintenance and this, that and the other. Or are you going to be sending this thing off with some MLRS or MLRS replacements and lots of stuff? And if you're sending that, we well, probably want to send some local defense for it. And all of a sudden, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're quite light organic ISR base starting to look an awful lot like a a lightweight or a heavyweight BCT. Um, again, the, the the problem you get is when you know the division. A lot of the stuff that it will be in a BCT would be a divisional troop, and you can allocate it to the main asset. If you were fighting 
the entire British army, which, you know, the entire British armored army with, um, with just two BCTs, somehow you're going to have to be able to chop assets between, between the two. And this is quite ambitious for an army that hasn't actually had a brigade level field exercise for decades. Um, a lot of it can be done in simulating, a lot of it can be done, be done there, but I think again, it, it, it's, it's a work in progress and it's going to be very, very driven by the platforms. Uh, Nicholas isn't here, so I can say it. I mean, I suspect, uh, you know, Mr. Boxer is going to be flogging a lot of chassis to the British Army because it's cheaper to run, um, it's compatible and it's modular, which means that, you know, we can we can double count it. But I can see an awful lot of platforms going onto onto the Boxer chassis. So look, uh, final thoughts. Uh, we we're at our time. We've got to write write up uh, wrap up. I just want to give you both um, a chance for final thoughts. Anything to do in the integrated review or in the command paper? I think for me, the you know, I, I I think there's a lot of good stuff in there. You know, I think the IR does set out a big idea. I think it. Um, you know, sets out strategic framework, it sets out serious priorities, it sets out um, some, you know, sensible changes in how government does its big business and, and organizes across different departments, across different levers power. I think the command paper, you know, there are some, you know, some sensible prioritizations. And as has been said, it is, you know, closer to being funded. And, you know, we could argue that this is at least a more um, for, for, it, for its faults, of which obviously we've discussed some of, it is a more specific funded plan than the previous plan, which was a bit more notional because of the, the shortage of money. I think that all being said, the, the, I think there are some sensible bets being made on technology and playing to a lot of the UK strengths, which is inevitably in both soft power, but also um, you know, the more expeditionary kind of maritime and air and cyber capabilities rather than you know large scale you know, land forces that sort of makes sense for a, a maritime nation such as the uk that's going to be playing a supporting role in any large land conflict to the americans the, the germans the poles the turks whoever in, in nato i think the the challenge though is that all of this new technology these new kind of innovative innovative um concepts or operations all of the global persistent engagement, all of that makes sense in terms of delivering the effect. But to be able to actually achieve that, you need a lot of changes in the fairly unsung and unsexy bits of defense. So you need changes in the kind of organizational structure and culture. You need changes in how we do procurement and capability and force development. You need changes in careers and recruitment, retention, training, etc. And, and the IR and the command paper do talk about those things and they do talk about, you know, they talk about people being the biggest asset. They talk about the need for getting rid of legacy ways of doing things and, you know, embracing innovation and working close with industry and all these things, all of which sounds great. And I'm fully supportive of the challenge, of course, is just how do you deliver that? Um, and the reality is that defense has had real problems delivering legacy platforms and and we're now seeing that in land you know it's a struggle ultimately upgrading a tank and upgrading an armored fighting vehicles turret neither of which are particularly innovative or um new activities for a, a, an army or, or a defense um ministry and there are all sorts of complex reasons why that's happened and, and that makes sense but it is a a whole new proposition to say that the, you know you're going to have to get good at being an intelligent customer and user for AI, an intelligent customer and user for space, and an intelligent customer and user for cyber and robotics and nanotech and all these other things, um, which we're going to need to make all of this work. So, you know, there's a lot of good ambition and instincts in there. It's just then putting the detail on it, which, as we've discussed, is, is probably lacking in some areas, at least in the public documents. And then it's making sure that there is the genuine leadership and cultural change to drive that that through in the coming years, because otherwise you're going to end up you know, getting rid of the sunset capabilities, which, OK, fair enough. 
but you're not going to end up getting the sunrise capabilities that are supposed to offset the, lo the losses of those sunset capabilities. I think that's 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 the the challenge and the opportunity from my perspective is, is how can we actually make that jump? You know, we've now we've now committed that we are sunsetting certain things. Fine, but can we now actually make the jump to the new sunrise capabilities? Question mark. I don't know. You know, that's not really a it's not really a question of money. It's not really a question of um, of technology. I think it's mostly a question of culture and political will. And they're both going to have to, you know, we're gonna, they're both going to have to be sustained over the coming um, few years. We're going to have to see some really strong leadership to make this work from whoever the new chief of defence staff is, uh, and all the way down for the organisation. Yeah, very eruditely said, James. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I, 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 I'd, agree, I'd agree broadly with that. I mean, I think, unlike previous defence reviews since the Cold War, this one at least sets out a vision of what the armed forces are there to do, and a fair bit about how they're going to do it and what toys they're going to get. Um, there's technical risk, and I'm just going to read this conclusion from the latest um, select committee report whether this report reveals a woeful story of bureaucratic procrastination military indecision financial mismanagement and general ineptitude and that's the real problem the mod has got to address uh, as we were discussing earlier that the problem that the, the, the armed forces have it's very hard to see how you can bring in a, a a mover and shaker who hasn't got military experience but if you've had 20 years of cuts the good guys are going and have gone, You're, you, you've already got what would have been the second or third division um, at the top. And I don't know how they fixed that. And um, we all know that, um, you know, the same accusation has been leveled at the civil service by Mr. Cummings and others. So the success of this policy is not actually going to be tied up in the detail of weapon design or even the detail of how much money it is. And for sure it'll go bust and it'll need more money, but um, it's going to be, how do you reform government? And the last time we were sort of here were the Cardwell reforms um, that, that, that left us the regimental system that went, you know, post Crimean War that then led to what was possibly the best expeditionary force this, this country has ever fielded. But people forget they took 18 years. And, and that's where we are now. I'd start, if I was the Minister of Defence, by telling General Sinek Garter, congratulations, your tour is extended until you've answered five questions. Um, you know, your plan, now make it work. Um, but it's going, to, it's going to be interesting. And of all the places we could, could have been before it was released, um, I, think, I think generally it's a much better place to have been than it might otherwise have done, which just by no means makes it risk-free, simple or even right. But it's not a bad start. B plus. Very clear. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, yeah, the trouble with 18 years, particularly in a democracy, is the government is not necessarily stable in those 18 years. So 18 years can become uh, a lot of cycles of four years of um, catching up, passing the buck and collect, uh, starting again. So, yeah, uh, 18 years. It's a sobering thought. It's a sobering thought to to end on. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, so listen, uh, James, James Black, thank you very much. Patrick Benham Crosswell, thank you very much. And Nicholas Drummond, absent, but... Thank you, O2.